Charlie here up at Coventry catching up with progress um, what involvement Night Fright had in D-Day and why it's so significant to us really so yeah we've had quite a lot of coverage quite a lot going on recently so you know welcome to all the new followers across our social media channels I mean as as always the, the physical restoration of Night Fright is is you know the core focus of what we're doing but you know the project involves a lot more than that sort of in the background really whether that's you know, myself or Neil or, or Joe, you know, creating content and, you know, putting together partnerships. I mean, we've got some, some great partners, some great sponsors. Um, one of the newest ones, which you've all probably seen, hopefully, is, is the Warbird Coffee Company, working with, with Adam and John, who have put together uh, a blend of coffee that exactly replicates what would have been drunk on base at Membry during the 1940s. So really excited to be working with those guys. Aviation Heritage Spirits, hopefully you've all seen as well, which launched a few months ago in December. We're, we're really privileged to have been um, working with Warbird Digest magazine. Richard Paver wrote a fantastic article and update for us, which is published in the latest issue of the magazine, which has just come out recently. And there's also some, some stunning photographs in there, which is well worth a look. We've also got some, some podcasts coming out, I think. We worked with um, the 436 Operations Group at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Uh, we're actually recording a, another another podcast here at Coventry today with, with History Hack. And I'm sure those of you on Facebook have been following the, the progress of what we're calling Mini Night Fright. So we're working with Richard's Spreckly Scale Modelling and, and Richard's doing a, a fantastically detailed model of Night Fright for us, which is coming on really, really well, as, as you can probably see from the photos. and. Hopefully Rich is going to have that ready and we're going to accept the model at Membry Airfield. With regards to Night Fright herself, um, you know, over the last few weeks and, and months really, the update is wings, wings, wings really. And that's, it's been a project within a project, but something that we're very close to finishing. I think by, certainly by the middle of June, pretty much everything on the wings will be complete. I mean, the guys have been beavering away full time completing the various repairs on the wings, whether that's attach angles, uh, spar booms, aileron hinges, you, you name it, we, we've done it really. So as with everything else, Night Fright has been much more involved, much more labor intensive, and much more expensive than, than we imagined at the start of the project really. But we are, we are nearly there. Um, and as we talk now, we're pretty close to, to reskinning the wings, which will see them probably completed, as I say, middle of June. And we're hoping to go straight through to a final top coat paint finish on the wings, which to all intents and purposes will be the first part of Night Fright to have her top coat applied. As, as you all know, history is important to us, detail is important to us, and, and D-Day was a, a significant day for Night Fright um, and the men of the 436 Troop Carrier Group. And, you know, it's, it's a really, really significant day for us, Night Fright and the project, and we're lucky enough to have Neil Jones over, over at Membry Airfield today, and, you know, he's going to talk you through a little bit of the detail, you know, what the 436 Troop Carrier Group would have been up to in the hours before D-Day, and, you know, getting the aircraft and the paratroopers and, and the gliders ready. So Neil's going to tell you all about what Night Fright would have been up to on D-Day. My name is Neil Jones, part of the Night Fry C47 Restoration Project on the 77th anniversary of D-Day at Membry Airfields in Wiltshire. It's unbelievable to think that here I am on hallowed ground where Night Fry would have operated from throughout 1944 uh, and especially on this hugely important day in history. To talk you through the, uh, the timeline of what happened on the 5th of June, the day before D-Day, where everything was happening on the airfield from four squadrons preparing to launch to a second wave of gliders being prepared um, and of course the the hundreds of paratroopers that would have uh, been brought to the airfield uh, in preparation for for boarding those c-47s uh, on that evening of 5th of june the ground crews um, operation staff everybody was involved in, in ensuring that you know the all the planning was, was done and dusted. Aircraft were in the, the prime condition that they could be. The four squadrons had their mission plans. The first two squadrons, the 80th and the 79th, was going to be involved in Serial 9, which involved taking the 1st Battalion, the 502nd, into, into Normandy, followed then by the 81st and the 82nd Troop Carrier Squadrons. 
who would follow minutes later really in serial 10. They would be joined by one of the squadrons from the 437th Troop Carrier Group from Ramsbury Airfield. The 85th Troop Carrier Squadron came here to assist. But for serial 9, for Night Fright itself, uh, there were 36 C-47s involved in the mission. They were all lined up on this huge expanse of tarmac and concrete forward of where I'm looking right now. And yeah, what a sight it would have been really when, when thinking of I am literally facing the ghosts of 36 C-47s pointing towards me with hundreds of, of paratroopers, you know, preparing themselves, strapping on their weapons, their kits, their T-5 parachutes. Yeah, to go back 77 years ago would have been such uh, an amazing achievement to do. But again, at about 10 o'clock, it would have been engine start for the C-47s at night. And at, at 11 o'clock at night, 2300 hours, Colonel Adrian Williams, the commanding officer of the 436, was the first to launch in his C-47. And then the entire serial nine of 36 aircraft uh, followed and they headed off to Normandy, the, the day of days. So I'm fortunate to have a number of original wartime maps that covered the areas involved for troop carrier groups within this area. But this map of South Southwest England is, is a great one because it really shows Membry uh, and some of the other kind of troop carrier uh, group airfields. And this shows the routing they took on the night of 5th of June to head to Normandy. So from flying from Membry, they would head south all the way down to uh, just west of Andover to a waypoint called Austin. From there, they would head on a southwestly heading to call sign Elko. Then they would head in that same southwesterly heading for Portland Bill, called San Flatbush. There they would then go feet wet into the channel to a ship that was transmitting the, uh, the next waypoint for Gallup. There was then a small change of course to a more southerly heading where they would go in between the Channel Islands. So the Channel Islands were obviously controlled by, by German forces they'd uh, invaded. So the intention was never to fly over over those islands but to skirt around them. So from there we would have to switch then to to another map to get onto the onto the maps for Normandy. So this is where things began to uh, become a little bit more hairy for for the crews because this was probably the first time the majority of them would have actually flown over enemy territory and they would then fly just to the Normandy Peninsula and coming in from the west coast of the Normandy Peninsula and that's when they hit the, that famous fog bank which caused a little confusion for a number of the serials involved in Operation uh, Albany. However, Serial 9 managed to successfully kind of navigate their way through uh, in, in a fairly tight formation and they were heading towards their drop zone, drop zone A, uh, around the village of Saint-Germain de Varaville where they dropped their load of sticks of paratroopers from the 502nd and it was deemed a success. Remarkably, you know, even though most of the crews um, did suffer some form of damage through uh, anti-aircraft artillery and flak fire, uh, none of the C-47s were lost and all the crews uh, survived, which is a miraculous kind of event and we're thankful that that happened. So having returned back to memory on the early hours of 6th of June, there was no letter really for, for the crews and for the ground crews. Um, the crews got debriefed, uh, what they were used to call back then interrogated by in their intelligence staff and then went into crew rest or tried to, uh, try to calm down enough to go into crew rest however, because uh, later on in the day they would be involved in the glider mission, Mission Elmira. So, the 436 was tasked with carrying 82nd Airborne, the 319th Glider Field Artillery Battalion. They would be flying in 50 gliders from memory, 48 Horsa gliders, which were British built gliders, and two CG4A gliders. So it was another day, another busy day for, for the 436, involving towing 50 gliders onto the runway, getting all the C-47s that were allocated for that mission into the correct position for the tow and eventually in the evening of, uh, of 6th of June the crews for both the C-47s and the gliders would start boarding their uh, aircraft ready for their launch. The time of drop over Normandy would have been uh, around 11 o'clock at night so they launched about between 7 to 7.30 p.m. on the 6th of June. It was a very, very important mission which uh, was successfully carried out by the 436 
Again, no C-47s were lost on the mission, even though they were flying lower, slower, because of the heavy gliders that they were towing. But they did suffer a significant amount of damage on this mission, and quite a few aircrafts were hit by flak and anti-aircraft artillery, including night flight, which we've got documented as, as receiving 100 hits on, on the fuselage. And that was the reason why she was out of action for four days uh, after returning back to Membury on the, on the 6th of June. Again, Another important factor of the war and something that we are very, very proud to publicise that night flight involvement was not only for paratroop missions, but for glider tow missions as well. And uh, she did a significant amount of them throughout the war. So we talk a lot about the, the events of 1944-1945 and the role night flight played in it, so now we look forward to the future for Night Flight, you know, the, the preservation as one of those best ever C-47s flying in the world. Um, not only that, you know, the, the future for the entire project, you know, expands from just a flying aircraft to, you know, preserving the memory of, of those men that flew before us. And part of that preservation is going to be a hangar for Night Flight here on our old airfield at Membury, which is unique anywhere in the world, I think, for, for a C-47, which is not only special, but exciting times for us as a team. Once the aircraft's finished, you know, I'm sure there'll be air shows clamoring for, for seeing this aircraft perform uh, at the shows, and we'd be super keen to kind of uh, get the public on board the aircraft and for us to kind of impart that knowledge that we've, that we've um, gained from, uh, from our research and uh, hopefully, People to, will take something away from uh, from being on board night flights and and pass it on to others and uh, and yeah, it's all about passing that information and hist history to future generations. <laughs>